Hello and welcome everyone to the third day of the Afghan virtual event. I'm Prema Rahman, the policy analyst at the Muslim Public Affairs Council, MPAC. If you missed our previous two sessions from the summit um, about refugee resettlement and the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, they can be found on the MPAC national YouTube page. Today, we have a great panel discussing the foreign policy and national security implications of the uh, unfolding crisis in Afghanistan. I'll leave the introductions for our panelists to Joseph, who will be moderating today. For those who don't know Joseph, Joseph Azam is a lawyer, policy advisor, and writer. His practice is focused on global anti-corruption, financial crimes, and internal and government in investigations. He currently serves as Senior Vice President, um, Global Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer at Info and as Board Chair of the Afghan American Foundation. Joseph, uh, I'll hand it off to you right now. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much. Um, so welcome everybody to the third day of our summit with MPAC discussing um, how we can better empower Afghans and Afghan Americans and reframe narratives and provide support. Um, I wanna get right to today's discussion because we have a very um, expert panel and I think we have an important topic to talk about. Um, very briefly, just as um, an introduction for folks who don't know the foundation, um, the Afghan American Foundation is a nonprofit a nonpartisan organization focused on um, raising public awareness, um, you know, creating thought leadership uh, and, and really shaping public discourse for Afghan Americans. Uh, and we've been um, critically involved in partnering with organizations within our community uh, and outside uh, in responding to the current crisis. Um, so today's panel, I think, is one of the most important um, that we're going to have, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks across our events, uh, and it really focuses on um, the crux of uh, the situation in Afghanistan, specifically how we got there, uh, and really where to go from here. Uh, I want to briefly talk about our, our panelists, uh, who are both experts in their own right. Uh, Nazila Jamshidi is a gender uh, equality and human rights specialist involved in Afghanistan's development and democracy processes uh, for the past decade. She has worked extensively on the ground across the country uh, for the UN, USAID, IFRC, and various other international organizations. Uh, she came to the US in 2016, uh, where she uh, studied government at Georgetown, and she's currently um, continuing graduate research there. So I'm um, very honored to have her. Um, she's an expert in human rights, foreign policy, and gender issues specifically. Uh, and all of those are going to be critical parts of the conversation today. Also, we have Dr. Mir Sadat, who has more than 25 years experience working and writing extensively on US national security uh, in Afghanistan, South Asia, the broader Middle East, and space. He is currently a senior fellow at the uh, Atlantic Council's uh, Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Uh, he's also an adjunct with uh, the Modern War Institute at West Point and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Previously, he was detailed to the US National Security Council at the White House, where as a policy director, he led interagency coordination on defense policy and strategy issues. Uh, I should mention also that he has served, so in and out of uni military uniform, he has spent a considerable amount of time uh, in various assignments within the US national security enterprise and various war zones. Uh, and he has been deployed on the ground uh, several times to Afghanistan, where he has um, provided strategic advice um, to two ISAW force commanding generals. Um, so Dr. Sadat is um, one of the leading experts, uh, you know, writ large uh, on these issues, but particularly I'm proud to say uh, within the Afghan American community, an incredibly important voice. And so we're very fortunate to have him here today. Um, so getting right into it, um, you know, I, I wanted to sort of focus our conversation first on how we got here. Um, you know, the three of us spoke, and I think none of us seem very interested in pointing fingers. I think that's an important dynamic to maintain for all of us in this conversation. But I think it's important to talk and be honest about how we got here. Um, so, Nazil, let me start with you uh, and ask, you know, how, how did we get here? What assumptions were incorrect? Um, what was taken for granted? What was misunderstood? Because um, I can't imagine that the current outcome is what had been uh, anticipated or planned for. Oh yeah, thank you, uh, Joseph, uh, for having me. It's a pleasure sharing the panel with you and Mr. Sada. And it's uh, good to see that uh, recently many experts and scholars are trying to cover Afghanistan because 
the real mistake or the uh, path we have gone wrong with our foreign policy with regards to Afghanistan. And I think it's people's right to know, uh, uh, to exactly know what we, uh, we, we, we have done wrong and we, are, we could have done better. So while many of, our, of many, many of us are talking uh, nowadays about like spending close to one trillion on the war that ended with such kind of situation, uh, many others are sad for those honest and tireless work that both Afghans and Americans have done uh, uh, to build a prosperous Afghanistan. And I hear from many of my veteran friends, from the friends who were engaged with development program and those who risked their lives to end the violence and build a democratic society uh, uh, in Afghanistan. And they are deeply sad for such an end and, um, and what is happening back there I mean, in Afghanistan. So back to your question and uh, 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 what, uh, what were the path we have wrong and what was the thing that we have underestimated on the ground. Unfortunately, while many good intentions, I should uh, insist there were many good intentions involved in the 20 years of engagement. And I witnessed them firsthand, many things, uh, but unfortunately many things went wrong. And uh, I, uh, as a, one of those people, uh, a person like with a very little and a small part of the group who has spent years among our funds, I have seen how continuously we have underestimated the people grievances, their lack of access to immediate needs. We, have, we had the chance to address them from the very beginning. But let me speak about our like, you know, our approaches with, um, with some like fundamental work, with some critical work we have done on the ground. And one of them is like a, a state building, for example. And we have, and, and, and let me tell you how we ignore people's voices in it. I mean, our approach with a state building uh, and uh, was, I mean, it was a very good decision. Uh, uh, it was a very, I mean, we have done very well with, rec with recognizing that uh, Afghanistan needed a state and we have done very well with that. And we wanted to build a transparent, capable, and a democratic state, which was very generous of the United States, and it was a very good decision. But we took the wrong path, unfortunately, for doing that. For, I mean, from the very beginning with that, I mean, the constitution that we have helped Afghans to develop it. Um, it was like, you know, we helped them to develop a constitution which would centralize all the power of such a diverse and multi-ethnic country to only and only one person. And I better to say, I mean, one American backed person. So uh, we, we didn't give, I mean, we really need to understand that. We didn't give Afghans a president. We gave them a sultan. We gave them a king with the whole power in his hands. And it's, I mean, and it's interesting. I mean, for me, it's very interesting to say that because we were the nation so familiar and benefited from a system with check and balance. And, but when it came about Afghanistan, we unfortunately, we fell to, same the path, uh, to follow the same path. So for years, we supported a president who was unable to respond to his nation's need and didn't even understand his people, neither himself nor his so-called advisor who were, all, who were mostly people with dual nationality and zero knowledge of the country's culture and condition. Um, we, we, we underestimated people's grievances from lack of services, and we totally ignored the danger of backing an incapable and transparent, corrupt, and irrespons irresponsible government. So, we, uh, so let me... Um, let me emphasize a state without service delivery is a failed state. A state that cannot protect people's life and property is a failed state. And a state with its critical position of service delivery all filled with uh, with uh, 
with young, inexperienced, westernized, and the people with zero knowledge of the society is a failed state. And we backed a failed state and ignored the danger of doing it. Today, unfortunately, the consequence of this mistake is all on Afghans and is all on American people only. And, 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 and again, I, I should say, we wanted to build a democratic society, but, uh, but uh, in every election, we stood with the candidate who didn't achieve the people's vote. In, I mean, for example, in the last election, only less than a million casted their vote, their votes, and we have seen two inauguration in one day. Yet we recognize Ghani's victory in presidential election. So all these together uh, led us to fail in a state building, which was such a, I mean, such a fundamental step uh, we have taken in Afghanistan. Uh, we built a state, but unfortunately, we built a weak state, a state with no capacity to deliver service to its citizen, and a state with a legitimacy under question. And, and uh, this is at least something I have watched firsthand and closely in Afghanistan and among the Afghans. And I have uh, seen it among, and when I'm saying about among the Afghans, I, I mean um, Afghans in the provinces, Afghans in the village and the remote areas. I'm not speaking about the small community of residential palace or the capital. Uh, uh, but the people of provinces and the people, uh, those, we let them to go to the arm of the Taliban. So Dr. Sadat, like what, what's, your, what's your response to that and, and where do you agree and where do you differ on that in terms of the assumptions that we were operating under, um, things that were misunderstood or um, Miss or or measured incorrectly in sort of getting us to August fifteenth. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with most of the things that uh, Miss Nazila Jamshidi said. Uh, very very good comments there. I think one of the other parts that we were missing was that uh, after nine eleven, when we when we went back to re resurrect an Afghan state that didn't exist, uh, the the people that were willing to fight most for that state were of course the ones that were oppressed by uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So uh, the, the minorities of Afghanistan, the Tajiks, Hazara, the Aymaqs, and others, uh, Uzbeks, they, they filled in and they did the hard lifting. And those are the ones that are now running for their lives, right? Uh, and so one of the central figure uh, topics is the failure of the Afghan state was really the failure of the Pashtun alienation. I don't know how that could have been fixed. I'm not giving a solution here, but one of the reasons that in military doctrine, uh, we say center of gravity for the Pashtuns uh, went to the Taliban who were delivering the services that uh, you know has been mentioned. Uh, and they, uh, they were alienated by the government. And uh, so then they viewed the government as not representative of them. And that's a bad thing. Uh, that's, that's, when, what, that's when ethnic groups go to, or uh, religious groups go to the arms of uh, another group that promises them greatness. And we see today that, that that was a mistake on their part. Um, so very quickly, a different angle, right? In Afghanistan, 20 years uh, to almost a date, uh, uh, we fought 21 year wars. Uh, when you send a military to war, you don't send them to go and manage or stabilize an or a society just, you know, and then leave, right? If you do that, it's gonna unpend again. When you go to war, you go to win. You either annihilate your enemy or you subjugate them. There's no in between, right? Like when, when the Romans did that, they either lopped off someone's head or they would say, hey, now you're gonna collect taxes for us. That's, that's how far back we go to military doctrine. In Afghanistan, we didn't do that. Every year we fought a new battle and new fight. Uh, so that was one problem. The other problem that Afghanistan has that Vietnam also had that the comparison is very good is that it had porous borders and had neighbors that were, uh, you know, intervening and, you know, uh, um, destabilizing uh, the Afghan state and the Afghan society. And so Afghanistan, unfortunately, lives in the worst, you know, zip code of the world, right? You have China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, and then other groups coming in, Chechens, stuff like that. And so that, that zip code really went against uh, any type of stabilization, statecraft, or civil society development. Although 
you know, great progress was made. Um, when it comes to it, 2014 was a monumental year for Afghanistan in the military terms because the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and the Chechens and the Uzbek fundamentalists that were from Uzbekistan trying to overthrow the Uzbek government and other groups, they were really retreating in the Wallis, which are the districts, right? The 365 or so districts. And the Afghans were ahead and the Americans and the Italians and the ISAF forces were right behind them giving them supplies. And the, they were ready to be annihilated, right? The purpose of war, uh, to annihilate your enemy. And I'm not advocating for uh, killing or anything like that. In war, there is no killing. You just eliminate an enemy or you, uh, you make it so that they are no longer a threat, right? At that moment, the US leadership in 2014 said, stop, we're changing direction. We're not gonna go further after them. So imagine a cancer treatment that you, uh, you start and then you stop in midway and say, oh, well, we made some progress. We don't have to continue the cancer treatment. Uh, you think that, that, you know, that, that you're gonna survive cancer? No, you gotta go full force after the treatment. 2014 also is a great year uh, to reckon that that's the year the Afghans, the, the Afghan, special, Afghan National Special Forces, including the police forces were in the lead. They were the face of the counterinsurgency and the counterterrorism. And the Americans and the Europeans were providing logistical supply, air cover, and other things to, you know, help make sure that the Afghans know what they're doing, command and control and stuff like that, so that the Afghans can actually go fight and someone behind them is sort of like their coach helping them. So that, that was a, a monumental year. Uh, if we go further down, uh, 2016 is a very important year, right? And, and we're talking that since the start of the Afghan state until today, over 70,000 uh, Afghan military personnel and police have been martyred, right? Uh, uh, righteously uh, fighting for their nation, martyred by terrorists, right? Whether it's Taliban or Al Qaeda or some other variation. Uh, so the Afghans have borne the brunt. So when the you know others say, oh, the you know where are we fighting? Therefore, since 2016, there has not been a U.S. casualty in war. Right. So there was no war, there was no U.S. soldiers dying because of war in Afghanistan. So the whole story, the narrative is a bunch of hogwash to say that, oh, we were, you know, guys were coming back in body bags. Guys come back in body bags from uh, Camp Pendleton all the time because of a mishap. Right. So then do we stop exercises there? No. So that was an important piece. The last administration pursued a sort of pragmatic approach and wanted to talk with the Taliban. Right. Uh, and in doing so, the Doha agreement was perceived by the Taliban as uh, are the Americans' terms of surrender. And so they stretched it out as long as they could. They signed it, and they considered that the terms of surrender. Unfortunately, in the uh, Doha agreement, there are clauses that talk about conditions. And, and I, was, I was in the White House. I can't talk about the specifics of it, but we were there, and we had made special conditions that if they don't agree with certain parts of it, that this agreement is null and void and we will go back. And there's nothing that will keep us there. And, you know, uh, let, let the Taliban come and try to attack us. Like if it comes to war again, who do you think is going to win, the Taliban or the U.S., right? They're not, you know, it might be a little protracted, but they're not going to win. Uh, so conditions on the ground were miserable. Uh, and we announced our pullout. We announced it on day one uh, of the new administration. Basically, the first few weeks, we said we're going to pull out. The national security team of the new administration, the current one, was not set up. You have 5,000 national security positions that were vacated, and the DOD was completely gutted. And we didn't have the undersecretary for policy and defense. And we didn't have many positions at state even. And who, who orders a retreat at, from a country they've been engaged in for 20 years, right? 20 years uh, after only you know, two, three months in office and saying effective by you know, August. Uh, so that basically what they did was the, the whole concept of the Americans and the international forces of saying we are Shana by Shana with you, shoulder to shoulder with you, was basically like, hey, we're, we're, we're heading for the exits. Uh, good luck, guys. Uh, and promises were made to translators, hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, people that were not just translators, but engineers and other types, right? Um, and they were all sort of left there. And so... That is not a good uh, business practice from a military perspective or as a global leader. And so that is a problem. Now, let me finish not on a sad note. Um, 
20 years we've been there, you know, and, and Joseph, you and I are, are I'm, I'm a little older than you, but you and I remember uh, Afghanistan. These, these folks that are, you know, in their 20s now uh, grew up in a relatively peaceful Afghanistan by P Afghan standards, right? Uh, sure, IEDs were going off and stuff like that, but there was not house-to-house, -house, you know, combat and stuff like that. Uh, and these ha people have, according to the Maslow hierarchy of needs, they have a, a different view of the world. And when they heard that the Taliban are coming in, it was like the boogeyman, right? The boogeyman is coming for them. Grown men, uh, special forces calling me, talking to me. And one of the reasons was, like, I talked to this one guy and he said, when I was a kid, my mom would say, if you don't go to sleep, I'm going to tell the Taliban to come free. And he's now a 25-year-old guy in special forces, and that's it left an imprint in him, right? So the Taliban had been made into a boogeyman. And, and when, when the Americans left and the Europeans left, the Afghan special forces didn't have close air support. How are you going to fight a, a enemy that is hiding in the mountains? They didn't have logistical support. They didn't have medical evacuation support. They didn't have uh, satellite uh, uh, imagery support, and they did lost all sort of uh, logistics and communications uh, uh, coordination capability. This is an Afghan military that came out of 50 years of war, right? Resurrected, uh, like uh, Nazila John just said, it, it resurrected and just sort of put together. Uh, and this is not something that you can send against a, uh, a very uh, tested enemy, the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. So that that is a, a problem in a sense. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. And I think one of the things that teases out for me, and Nazil John, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, is um, the move uh, for, for, for US policy from being values-based to more transactional and pragmatic. And I think we could probably agree that that shift started under the Obama administration and then continued to be even more transactional under the Trump administration. One of the words, and we promise to be unvarnished here, so one of the words I've heard a lot um, from people there and here is betrayal. And so I wanted to actually talk about that, about that, about that, the, the thought of a betrayal. And as John, we talked about how that's something you've heard as well. So would you, would you couch what's happened as a betrayal of our values or the Afghan people or both? Um, what are you hearing? And then, Dr. Sadat, it'd be great to get your, your take on that as well, because I think you're in touch with different constituencies that maybe are saying those same things. So, Nazil, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, well, I think, uh, uh, well, as a woman and as a woman uh, among Afghan women and among Afghan uh, people, I think one of the time uh, uh, that the people of Afghanistan felt like betrayed uh, was in 2019. And, and, and especially among those group, I was seeing women. And let me, I mean, with, uh, with the Afghan women, let me, I mean, uh, starting, a little, give you some more detail a little bit, and then we go to the point. So if there was uh, one area of success that every American was satisfied with, uh, was the progress made by women of Afghanistan, was the progress uh, was made in women's condition, their role in the society, and realization of some of their human rights. And that, I mean, and they were truly our success stories of 20 years of development and engagement in, uh, uh, down there. Similarly, Afghan women were considering like, you know, Americans uh, as their greatest supporter, and I have, seen very uh, uh, close uh, co cooperation and coordination uh, on a shared goal between Americans and Afghans on the ground and in most of the uh, capital cities, uh, uh, if not in all of them. And women welcome the US uh, democratic values from the very beginning and became our closest allies in the country. And that's why we can, I mean, uh, we cannot leave them alone today. But back to your point, I mean, if there was a time um, if Afghans uh, felt betrayed, I'm talking from, I mean, as a woman and as, uh, from women first perspective. As, as I said, unfortunately, yes, there was a time that women felt betrayed, and that was in uh, 2019 when Khalilzad signed the Doha agreement with the Taliban. And uh, as uh, Mr. Salad, I mean, explained, uh, uh, talked about the Doha agreement and the, and the problem uh, 
uh, in that process, I don't want to repeat his work, but I mean, let me explain, I mean, why and how people uh, felt like betrayed. In fact, Doha argument was like, um, let me, uh, was another wrong move we took that led us to uh, destroying 20 years effort and end of like a republic system in Afghanistan. And and that was uh, the agreement. And that agreement was the one that multiplied every effort for a state building and democratization uh, process of the country with zero. So I was following the news, the process uh, very, very carefully on those days. And I was really worried about the implication of such agreement on both Afghans and Americans. And uh, when I was watching uh, uh, signing the agreement by Khalilzad and, uh, and the Taliban leader, I was weeping and why I, I, know I was scared and I was right to be scared. It facilitated the way that led us to uh, where we are today. So, um, so it was the, I mean, the Doha agreement with, uh, uh, with regard to its content, let's uh, start with that and the article which was, uh, which it contained. I don't believe it was created deliberately. Well, again, I'm not, knowledgeable about um, peace process or the conflict resolution thing. But even with my very limited knowledge, I can critique at least the fact that it didn't state anything, literally anything about women's right, about women's gain and women's freedom in Afghanistan. And women's right is something we have made considerable, considerable progress. And we have spent a notable amount of money on it. So women were our most loyal supporters in Afghanistan. And the group who supported our democratic and liberal values in their country, and they promoted that in their country. So we totally ignored them in the so-called peace agreement and we let them feel betrayed. I mean, not only women, but all other Afghan people also took it as a deal, as Mr. Sadat mentioned, uh, as a deal uh, uh, between um, the, the United States and the Taliban, and therefore uh, the moral, I mean, gradually decreased among, uh, among Afghan people. They perceived it as a, like, you know, the end of the war and the end of US support to Afghanistan, which was the their greatest supporter and particularly to, uh, particularly to the women. And they start losing like trust and belief on their greatest supporter, which was the United States. So, um, so I was in Afghanistan and I saw that there was a very good relationship between Americans and Afghan, at least among the people of the city. Uh, um, because, well, I cannot say I'm among all Afghan people because they didn't have access to every um, area's people. And I have seen, for example, I have seen uh, US embassy uh, works and relation with people in Kabul and US consulate relations and work and coordination with people of Herat. So I should emphasize again that as I when I'm saying people, it doesn't mean like all people. People in the Roma remote area and village didn't have any access to to, um, to Americans. Uh, so but still it was I mean still it was good because they, they were working together, discussing the, the, the issues, I mean, together and meeting over, um, and meeting over like, you know, the common goals uh, to each other. But after the whole argument, that trust and desire of working together started to vanish. The argument, I mean, also lowered uh, the morale among every member of Afghanistan. I mean, among and even national forces, which I believe expert can elaborate on that. I'm not knowledgeable about that. So again, I mean, as Mr. Sadat mentioned, it was the Doha agreement that unfortunately legitimized the Taliban and the uh, American commitment. commitment. Uh, if we go back and look at the process, we were seeing that American commitment to the agreement was quite intangible, measurable, and immediate, like 
releasing 5,000 prisoners is an example of it. But Taliban commitment to that agreement was something, you know, based on words and and, and not a really action. So, so we actually we initiated such kind of uh, 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 agreement uh, with uh, with a member of Taliban. And I met some female member of peace negotiator in Washington last summer when they came here as the delegation. So they were complaining about lack of willingness to talk. I mean, complaining about the Taliban and their lack of willingness to talk and negotiate about women's rights with them. And months of negotiation didn't end up with any common agreement over women's role in the society. So let me end it here. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the agreement unfortunately was kind of a wrong step that we took, and it was it was it, it was the time that we gave the people of Afghanistan a feeling that hey, I mean, you are betrayed, and they really perceived it as that. And it wasn't, and it's something that we, uh, I mean, we are not against the peace. As I'm, and I'm speaking about, I mean, uh, the agreement and the problem uh, associated with that. It doesn't mean I'm against the peace. We all want, I mean, a wishful, uh, a, a peaceful uh, uh, peace or a world order. But that was a wrong step. And the agreement with those conditions didn't give American what they wanted, which was the a responsible and deliberate withdrawal. And surely it gave Afghans nothing but the current uh, tragedy. So let me stop here. No, thank you for that. So Dr. Sadat, I, I think you and I have been on some calls with, uh, with folks around evacuation. I know you're doing that work a lot with, with former military folks here, people who have served. What does that word, does that word betrayal come up in those conversations uh, as someone who sort of sit, sits on the outside now, but has been on the inside? Um, you know, what, what does that mean to you? And is that fair or unfair? No, that's a fair, fair assessment. And I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's usually tampering down my uh, American colleagues uh, and European colleagues, military, uh, current uniformed and veterans and saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm of Afghan heritage. You are more uh, hot about this than I am. Let's, let's take it down a notch. Um, but yeah, they, they, they are the most upset. Uh, let me take this back a little bit. So the, 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 the road to Doha is what really destroyed everything, right? And it, so Doha was definitely that inflection point and in, you know, the terms of surrender. But think about this. You know, you have an American soldier who walks off a uh, barracks or FOB in Afghanistan gets caught by the Taliban, Haqqani network or whoever. And then you're the Afghan government and you're going to uh, uh, prosecute an attack and incarcerate the Haqqani and the Taliban. And then your best ally, the United States does a prisoner swap and you know, gives the four, get more four for uh, Sergeant Bergdahl. If you're the Afghan government and if you're the Afghan forces, how do you view that? Right, your your sworn enemy is being handed over for one of your people. So, what's the life of an Afghan national security force uh, soldier or policeman? Right, nothing in that sense. So, so it started earlier on, years before Doha, with little instances like that, little instances where the, the Europeans were paying uh, the Taliban not to shoot at them. And of course, then you have another uh, international group, another country coming into that provincial reconstruction team. And they, the first month, they're getting shot up and killed until someone tells them, hey, aren't you paying your taxes to the Taliban? It's like, what? Americans are, we're not paying taxes to the Taliban. So he, here's, here's something that is very important where we veered off of our values-based foreign policy. You know, Ronald Reagan said, I will not negotiate with terrorists. His American diplomats were... In, in Iran for 444 days, right? Uh, and here is an administration that's, you know, trading a, a derelict soldier, an American derelict soldier who you should be prosecuted for leaving his barracks, his duty and everything, right? And he was trading him for four known terrorists, international terrorists, a group that is designated by the State Department as terrorists. So how far we veered off of our values and our structures, right? And so this is a, a problem because same thing happened in Iran with the freedom uprising there. You know, the, the, a couple of administrations ago, the, uh, the White House said, hey, we're with you. 
And then the Iranians uh, uh, rose up and said, hey, we want freedom, we want democracy and all of that. And then all of a sudden, we weren't there to deliver. We weren't there to help them. And when we weren't there to help them, guess what happened? The government started cracking these people's skulls and started incarcerating them. Uh, same thing with the color revolutions of Central Asia, the Caucasus Mountains, right? Same thing there. Uh, look at the, uh, the freedom movement in Hong Kong. So these are things that are happening. Uh, but to get back to Afghanistan, the betrayal is true. The betrayal is in, in, in many different ways. Um, we left, really, and we told the rest of the world, hey, uh, uh, you need to start packing your bags because we're going to be out of here at 12 o'clock. We didn't give anybody any chance to pick up their people. The Dutch embassy left their security guards, 60 security guards. They went for lunch. The embassy staff, they never came back. The embassy staff contacted a few of us saying, hey, uh, like, can you help us? Lord, where are we going to store these people? Right now, the only reason the United States went back to Afghanistan was not because the leadership in the White House or the leadership at the State Department or the leadership at the Department of Defense had common sense. It was because of public pressure of the veteran community, which is huge now in the aftermath of Afghanistan and the other wars, that were so disgusted by it, so appalled by it, right? These are people, some of them who signed up to go kill terrorists, jihadists, they would call them jihadists, right? But now they are fighting for their Muslim uh, partners there, right? So this going back to Afghanistan was at the hands of a lot of people in Congress, even people from the Democratic Party who are veterans like, uh, like Tammy Blackburn and others who were pushing for this. We are still pushing for a lot of other agendas. Right now we have 14,000 Afghans who are the brothers, sisters, children, or mothers of American servicemen. Current American military uniform servicemen's families, 14,000, we have a database that we collected because the Sec Secretary of Defense wanted it. And we have no way to get these people out. There are ways to get them out. We can get them on Qatar Airlines just like that because we are getting people out. But we, there's nobody that's t telling us that, hey, get these people on the next airport to Kabul or Mazar. Let's get them out. Nobody wants to deal with this headache of in increased refugees. My goodness, this is some sergeant. This is some American captain. You're asking him to lay down his life for this nation and this nation is betraying him by leaving his mom and dad or his children in Afghanistan. If that is not betrayal, what is? On top of that, most of these people, guess what career fields they have? They have intelligence career fields. In an intelligence community, if you have a liability, you cannot get your clearance. It gets revoked. If your family member is in Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan, or in, in Russia, they're, they are vulnerable and there could be harm done to them and you are they are a liability to you, right? So you could lose your clearance on top of that. We have an additional 100,000 special immigrant visa people, P2s and SIVs in safe houses and elsewhere that we've hidden. Safe houses that are not being funded by the UN, by the US government or anything like that. They're being funded through an organization called Flanders Fields that all the veterans are pouring in their money into that one organization and that one is running it for the entire Afghanistan. The owner right now, last month I talked to him and I'm trying to help him fundraise, is uh, eating his own savings right now, right? So this is a major problem. On top of that, I have, I have spe Afghan special forces who are fighting. I have one Afghan special forces person, I'm not gonna name him for safety, months before uh, Herat fell, right? The first city was Herat. Months before Herat fell, he was captured by the Taliban. They, he was a sniper. They cut off his uh, trigger finger, started cutting off other fingers. And his unit came to his rescue and freed him. A month before Kabul or a uh, Kabul fell, he had a daughter, first child. He named her America because he believed in the American cause. I have no way of getting this guy out. His passport is an old, expired passport. I cannot smuggle him across countries because that, that would jeopardize me. It would jeopardize him too for exploitation. This is a story like this is in every single, not just Afghans, not, not, not just NGOs that are working there. Talk to any American veteran and they will tell you the same story. My translator is SIV approved. I can't get him out. 
my partner who was Afghan Special Forces is stuck and is sleeping in the mountains. His wife and kids are moving around so they don't get raped. I have American citizens who cannot leave their daughters. One daughter is 20, the other one's 23. For goodness sakes, there's no other families left. She cannot leave the 23 year old in Kandahar by herself. In August, when we were evacuating people, I called her, I said, hey, special forces are gonna come and get you. And she was excited. And her daughters are, don't have green cards. She was in the process of getting it. And uh, spe special force said, hey, we're gonna land in your, in your area, in your courtyard. We looked at it, it's pretty big. We're gonna land there, pick you up. And she goes, great, I'll have my do two daughters ready. And they're like, what two daughters? It's like, you know, the 20 year old and 23 year old. She said, well, the 20 year old we can take, the 23 year old we can't. Because DHS and State Department says, if you're over 21, even if you're unmarried, you can't come in. For goodness sakes, you're going to leave a 23-year-old young woman, and she's also attractive, which is a problem on top of that, in Afghanistan, in Kandahar, while you're being helivac out of there? Like, what kind of nonsense is this? Stories like this are everywhere. I have at least 30 American families in this type of situation where they cannot leave their family members. American citizens that want to leave that State Department says they are not in imminent danger. My goodness, if that is not betrayal of Americans, I have no idea what is. So with that, you know, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of our government right now. I am disgusted by our government, every single branch, every single department, the, uh, the leadership in the White House, I'm disgusted by it. I'm disgusted by Congress because they're not getting united behind a bipartisan a solution of creating a presidential task force or a national task force for Afghan evacuation and resettlement. But I'm very proud of my American colleagues, whether they're Afghan American, Muslim American, Hindu American, whatever they are, humanitarians. And I'm very proud. I'm very proud today to be a veteran. That's what I'm proud of. Yeah, and I will say that um, across the board, veterans groups have been exemplary in trying to push the values that I think they believe that we have we have strayed, uh, strayed from. So um, I think that's something that we've seen in resettlement, we're seeing it in evacuation, we're certainly seeing it in advocacy. So I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate how personal this is, this is for you, Dr. Sadat. Um, I think, you know, we have about 10 minutes left before we, we will shift to, to sort of a, a focus on one of the groups that's doing work that can help. So in that 10 minutes, I think I want us to focus on what can happen next. Um, and, and I think that, you know, what's really important is, um, again, to be honest and be realistic about what's possible. And, um, you know, Dr. Stutt, I know, I know you just spoke very passionately, but I want to come back to you really briefly on this to start and then go to, to Nazila to follow up about, you know, two or three tangible things that, that can be done, whether it's through the White House, through Congress, or through both, uh, to help mitigate harm, because that's what we're talking about now, right? We're not talking about turning back the clock. We're not talking about uh, going back to a, a republic at this point tomorrow, but there is harm to be mitigated, right, for Afghan people and certainly for our allies. So Dr. Sadat, do you want to start briefly on that? And then Nazila will go to you to close on that point. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, eight, 36 million people supposedly in Afghanistan, 18 million want to get out. We can't get them out. That's not possible, right? So that, and the, for a variety of reasons, they want to get out from economic to whatever. But we need to get out the people that I just mentioned, right? And so we need to have some, we need to have an evacuation czar. We need to have one person that Congress and, and the executive branch can point to and say, what are you doing to make this happen? It can't be, it can't be 15, it can't be a school of, uh, of jellyfish. It needs to be an octopus. An octopus with one membrane with a bunch of tentacles that goes, does this stuff. If you have a school of jellyfish, it, it, there's no communication. That, so that's for the evacuation piece. And we need to be able to rack and stack and tell the Taliban, you touch one of our people that are on our list, right? Right now, when you get evacuated, the Taliban okays you, even if you're a, a governor that they don't like, sometimes they do that, right? They let you go unless you're on their blacklist. Uh, you touch one of these people, that's it. You are on sanctions. You can't go anywhere outside of Afghanistan. And that's it. Any money flow will go after it. And that's what we need to do. We can't, we can't just, you know, sorry, we can't just pussyfoot around with this thing. We gotta, we gotta be really serious because our values are important. Human rights are the backbone of America. We were founded on religious freedom and freedom to practice whatever we want. And if we can't, if we can't project that abroad, then we are no value. Second, on the resettlement aspect, 
we need a presidential task force like we did in Vietnam. President Ford had it. I actually sold this idea uh, to a bunch of people, floated it to people in the White House, was told, thank you very much. We'll talk to you if we have any further guidance or uh, questions. Um, but we need that. Ford, at that time, the Vietnamese situation was not as complicated as here. You didn't have the intelligence and, and terrorism factor as well back then. Uh, and you had two, three locations where those communities came. Here, it's all over the place, right? All over the place, all over even Alaska. So we need a president task force where either the chair is DHS or someone else, but the chair, whoever the chair is, is that central figure and they can task the other agencies and departments and make them accountable for it. And in that task force that Ford had, he had state and tribal organizations as well. And he had 18 veteran associations. My God, the Vietnam War is now you know decades behind us. The, the Iraq War is decades behind us now. Afghanistan has been, we've been in decades. We have thousands of NGOs to choose from. We have welcome.us, we have conglomerates, whatever. If there's a presidential task force like that for resettlement, and we need to put someone in charge who actually knows what they're doing, we need to put an elected official from a border state from the South, right? Not from someone from New England. We need to put someone from there who actually knows what refugee issues are and has some of those connections already well built and, and go forward with that. Okay. And the comparison to Vietnam is already there. If you're embarrassed that, oh, this is going to park about Vietnam, dude, like when people are hanging from planes as you're taking off on a C-17, like, dude, that's worse than Vietnam. So like, get over it. Afghanistan is way worse than Vietnam. Get over it. It will be a presidential and it will be a congressional political topic. So start fixing it. Start doing something good about it. Own the problem. Nobody is owning the problem of Afghanistan right now. Everybody's doing this. You can't have that. And if you, if you are a leader in the White House or you're a leader in the national security or the national apparatus, you got to step up your game and take ownership of this. Otherwise, you will, you will have to pay for it. That's fair, very fair. Nazila, what, from your perspective, uh, in a couple of moments, what, what next, what do you think should be the focus of, of the U.S. policymakers and those who have influence? Yeah, as I have this chance, I would like for this, I would like to emphasize on women. I mean, and what we can do with the women. And as we don't have that much time to talk about others. So I, I, I want to say we cannot walk away the, uh, from the situation in which women of Afghanistan are trapped in. And uh, this is our moral obligation. This is our political obligation to support women's fight for their basic rights. They are almost the, uh, the only voices raised against the discrimination and violence and that and we uh, and they should be supported and for that we have everything we have un in our side we have international institution world population and we have a political economic and diplomatic influence all around the world so hence we need to break this silence and stand with afghan women and we need to seek help from our allies within Islamic State, within global uh, leaders and humanitarian human rights organization, excuse me, uh, to protect women's human rights and make the Taliban to respect them. So I believe our um, international human rights lawyers and experts can help us with uh, effective strategies to do that, to do so. And uh, we, we, we also have uh, such a large Afghan diaspora community in our side who can share their expertise and experience for helping, uh, for helping our policymaker to come up with effective policy with helping women. So I understand we don't, I mean, I mean we don't have like some specific and immediate enforcement tool, but we have other tools and power uh, that can facilitate the kind of enforcement path. And we should apply them and bring them into the practice. So as a woman, honestly, I'm tired of hearing leaders expressing concern without taking any action. And just for the last thing I want to emphasize on another thing we can do and we really should do. Uh, and that's, I mean, to avoid uh, taking any other action that can further affect or harm uh, people of Afghanistan, and especially women. For example, I mean, the, the United States needs to come, uh, needs to be clear on whom 
be imposing sanction. Uh, the sanction should not uh, should only pressure the Taliban and not the innocent people of Afghanistan. So um, we we need to and we need to we are capable and we need to find a way uh, so that people uh, get some of their money. The bank is start to operate again and people uh, have access to food and uh, cash and other uh, basic needs. Uh, but we also need to prevent creating any condition in which the uh, in which can benefit the Taliban from the money. So I believe our economists and experts can come up with come up with very effective strategies to do to do that. It, that I mean that's not something I can say uh, how about it, and it's our economists' job uh, and relevant expert job to do it. But I can say it will greatly help women because they are the most vulnerable group of the society. And uh, the, the more people suffer from starvation, the more likely to exchange their daughters with money. And so uh, economic condition, unfortunately, has a direct impact on a women's condition. Women are more at risk of early marriage, forced marriage, <laughs> if their families suffer from starvation. So yeah, let me stop there. No, I think that's a really good point to raise and, and sort of taking a point of personal privilege here on behalf of the foundation, I'll say that, you know, for, for many weeks now, if not months, we've been focused on this issue of um, the economic collapse and how if that is not addressed, the people that Dr. Sadat is talking about will not survive the winter to get evacuated. That is the reality we're dealing with. And so, um, Nazila, thank you for bringing that up because this is a conversation about foreign policy and sanctions and economic pressure is of course a tool of US foreign policy. And in this instance, I think that as a community and certainly as experts who work in the space, um, many of us have gotten very impatient um, with what we see as a lack of action and a lack of urgency. Uh, and just to sort of put a frame around the risk here, we're talking about 25 million people being at the very edge of famine. Uh, in what is already a brutal winter. That's to say nothing of violence. That's to say nothing of lack of access to education or healthcare as was discussed earlier in our summit. So thank you for bringing that point up. I think that that's kind of inseparable from this issue of, of policy that we're speaking of more broadly. Um, so, um, you know, we've gotten some comments in the chat. I, I really encourage folks to, to read those, but, you know, I want to stop our conversation for now, although Dr. Sadat and Azila uh, will have their information available for folks who want to follow up. But one of the goals of our summit is also to, to empower people to act. And in doing that, we wanted to sort of talk about how the, um, the wake of U.S. foreign policy often reaches U.S. shores. And the way in which that's happening right now is actually in this crisis around resettlement, and getting people out and getting them uh, pathways to safety and, and security in the US. Um, one of the great organizations that has emerged out of this is a group of really talented Afghan lawyers. Um, and the project they're working on is called Project Anar. Um, that project is Afghan led and focused on ensuring that Afghans who are being evacuated and who are being resettled have access to credible, sustained, and reputable legal services. And so as part of that, we've invited um, some representatives from Project NAR to come speak about the project, because to us, those two issues are very closely related. Uh, and so I, I wanted to actually um, create some space and invite uh, Leila and, and Samia, if you're on, um, to, to join us, talk a little bit about your work. Certainly, if you have a response to what you've heard today, um, I welcome that, uh, your leaders in the community, but really you know, how, how your work is emerging and what people can do to support it, that'd be really helpful. Yes. Um, all right. My name is Layla. I see my name is Elizabeth Samia here, but this is Layla. Um, I am one of the lawyers and organizers with Project Anad. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thanks to the speakers for giving us space today. Um, we are a collective, again, of immigration lawyers, organizers, Afghans. Um, who have been focused really on folks who don't have many other options for immigration pathways. Um, obviously, in recent months, uh, that extends to even those who might have other options as SIVs or 
uh, be eligible for P2 refugee resettlement pathways, uh, but those processes are so backlogged. Uh, and as a result, folks have had to focus on one of the only pathways available to them that gives the government discretion to quickly permit someone to come to the US and pursue an immigration pathway, uh, and that's humanitarian parole. So I'm sure many of us have heard of people applying for humanitarian parole um, and even uh, members of Congress were sending people these applications. Uh, and our goal was really to put out as much information as possible to our community about uh, how to complete these applications, about what's currently happening with processing, uh, and to also do advocacy to put pressure on the government to use their discretion favorably to grant these applications uh, and to maintain pathways for people. Um, so our work is uh, directly connecting folks to pro bono assistance, working with partners uh, to make sure that um, lawyers who are providing pro bono assistance are uh, have access to the resources to do that. But also we recognize that a lot of people are pursuing pathways on their own. So we want to make all of that information accessible to, to the public generally in case folks are doing that on their own. Um, with the humanitarian parole applications, there is a fee per person that is $575. Uh, it is obviously an exorbitant cost at any time. Um, and it's one way to keep people from accessing pathways really. Um, and as much as we want to avoid handing that money over, um, especially when the pathway isn't guaranteed, uh, we raised money to assist people who need it to file those applications. We have shifted as much as possible to pursuing fee waivers, but um, there are still many people who might not be eligible for a fee waiver and need that assistance to be able to file this application. Uh, so I can share a link as well here um, that has quick access links to our donation pages. Uh, all of our donations go straight to filing fee funds. Uh, and if those funds are not used for filing fees, we receive excess donations, which at this point we've used all of our donations that we had raised. Um, if we have excess donations, they will go directly to supporting resettlement efforts. Uh, and the last thing that I wanna mention is just that um, while we are focused um, on Afghans who are in Afghanistan or in third countries, uh, it's not a separate issue from those who have already been resettled because so many people, not just those who arrived recently, but especially those who arrived recently, um, you know, things happen so quickly and chaotically that there's many who have immediate family members, um, like was mentioned on this panel, immediate family members who they are trying to get to the US uh, and we're supporting people in that position as well. Thank you, Layla. Yeah, I, I've watched Project Anar from its inception and I could say it's uh, probably one of the most successful efforts that have emerged within our community uh, with direct impact. So um, for all who are joining live and for those who are listening to the recording, um, you'll have the links. I really encourage you um, to support their work, not just financially, but also um, their policy positions. Right, because I think the humanitarian parole issue is so connected to the, the values that we talked about on this panel in terms of people keeping their word, uh, even down to President Biden saying that, um, you know, this is a moment for us to, to live our values and we're not, we're not going to leave anybody behind who shouldn't be left behind. Right. That's the work these folks are doing. So I'd encourage you um, to support it. Um, so with that, um, inconsistent with our cultural norms, um, we're going to end on time. Um, Dr. Sadat. Um, Nazila, thank you so much. This was not nearly enough time to cover what we wanted to cover, but your voices are incredibly important uh, and, and your perspectives, I think, are, are much needed. So I encourage folks to connect with you and, um, and PAC and AAF will be sharing a recording of this um, session to anybody who registered, anybody who would like to see it later on. So thank you for your time. And I thank MPAC for, for helping us create this space. Thank you. Thank you, MPAC, and thank you, AAF and everybody else. Thank you so much.